Good afternoon. Our program will begin in five minutes. Please take your seats and silence your cell phones.
For our final session of the day, please welcome back Satellite Executive Chairman Jeffrey Hill. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Thank you all so much for joining here. Uh, joining us here at Satellite 2023 for this very exciting closing keynote presentation titled Revolutionizing All Domain Mesh Networks at Planetary Scale by Illyria co-founders Chris Taylor and Brian Barrett. This past September, Google confirmed its all new space technology spin out company Illyria created with the mission to radically improve satellite communications, Wi-Fi on planes and ships and cellular connectivity. And today, we're going to see some of the uh, important results of that mission. Uh, I am honored to introduce our first speaker, Illyria CEO and co-founder Chris Taylor. He previously led companies such as Gavini, Navitas Group, and Mission Essential. He spent 14 years uh, in the US Marine Corps as an enlisted infantryman and force recon Marine. He also serves as the senior advisor to the National Security Innovation Network at the Pentagon and teaches graduate seminars at both Georgetown University and the George Washington University. Chris joins us today to share the vision of a company that aims to create, orchestrate, and manage the world's most advanced networks at planetary scale. Please welcome Illyria CEO, Chris Taylor. Q. Good afternoon. In book three of Sir Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, uh, which was also subtitled De Mundi Systemate, Systems of the World, he offered a thought experiment around his ideas on orbital motion. He said, hey, let's put a cannon on top of the tallest mountain in the world and let's shoot cannonballs at differing speeds to see what speed actually allows the cannonball to achieve an orbit, whether that be circular, elliptical, or just keep going uh, off into space. Let's see what those speeds are and what that means. It was basically the first time that we had ever thought about uh, artificial satellites in space. In the 1800s, Jules Verne wrote about artificial satellites in space. And of course, as we moved through time, in the mid 50s, Explorer 1, Sputnik began the space race. And we have all of the great discoveries today that you have made, such that my five-year-old daughter, Lucy, can lay in the grass, look up into the sky on a clear night, and watch all of your products race across the midnight sky. We don't really let Lucy stay up till midnight. Uh, but it sounded good. So think about that as we move through uh, today's demonstration. And that brings us to the story of Illyria. About 300 and I guess 71 days ago, uh, Illyria completed uh, an acquisition of these two technologies from Google. One is SpaceTime, which is a temporospatial software-defined networking architecture that we're going to demonstrate for you today. And the other is Typebeam, which is a coherent light, uh, atmospheric, free space, optics program. Now, we're going to focus on SpaceTime today because we're going to bring the heat in Paris in the fall for Typebeam. One of the things uh, that is important to understand about our story is that We've only existed for a year. We were in stealth till September. We came out of stealth. Um, all those articles came out that said we were building death beams from above and all kinds of craziness. But none of those things were true. What we were doing was working diligently to try and make connectivity as ubiquitous as it could possibly be, regardless of the technological discovery that we attached to it. Our first. Our first contract um, was with the Defense Innovation Unit out in Mountain View, California, with the space portfolio. Bucky Buto runs that space portfolio. I think Bucky's in the room. Uh, if he's not, you should meet him while he's here because he's on a panel tomorrow. And the whole view of hybrid space architecture is how do we bring together government, civil, commercial, 
partner nation assets in land, sea, air, and space, cislunar, cis Mars, and beyond, how might we create a digital cartilage that allows everyone to make use of every amazing discovery that all of you in the room today have made? Today, we're going to talk about that and how we can do it and how we can help. We heard earlier on a panel this morning, someone I think said something like, well, we need to get to SDN. We need to get to software defined networking. Maybe we're going to get there. Maybe we're not going to get there. Ladies and gentlemen, it's here today. We're going to be able to demonstrate to you that we can connect land, sea, air, and space in any orbit, at any altitude, at any frequency. And I think that at the end of this, you'll see how possibly we can make your spectrum more profitable, your services more valuable and easily accessible. But I'm not the guy to do the demonstration. Today, my colleague, Dr. Brian Barrett, is going to come out and walk you through the demonstration. So please welcome Brian Barrett. Hey, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, I have to also have to start by, by acknowledging what an honor it is for me to be here and represent the work of such an amazing group of, group of people. Um, when, we, when we were able to put this uh, company together and spin this technology out of Google, the vast majority of the teams that spent the last seven or eight years building this technology dropped what they were doing to come be part of it again. Um, they've all worked very hard to make this technology accessible to the industry. And I'm here representing their work. So I want to start off by acknowledging and thanking that. So to start off a bit, I want to come back to maybe some first principles in, in satellite communications and motivate kind of why we built the technology behind, sp behind space time and some broader themes uh, in wireless. One of the ways we achieve higher throughput at long range is through directional wireless transmission. It's the same reason that if you're trying to talk to someone across the room, we cup our hands to talk. We're focusing that energy. And that's a theme that I think is continuing in the satellite industry now. We're always trying to achieve higher throughput at longer distances. And that manifests itself with trends where we are increasingly moving to millimeter wave frequency bands, and we see free space optics and laser communications coming in the future already for inter-satellite links and in the future for satellite to ground uh, communications. But when you combine highly directional steerable beams of energy with mobility, network operations becomes increasingly challenging and complex. Mobility is a fact that's here to stay. I think as we, uh, and historically the industry was used to having just two altitudes at which we operated, geostationary orbit and the height of a tower. But population densities on Earth vary dramatically. There's an optimal altitude for every population of unserved users. And so we're seeing a world emerge where there's not only towers in space, towers on ground and towers in space, in the case of direct to handset communications, but layers of altitude in between, from high altitude platforms to low Earth orbit to mid Earth orbit and geostationary orbit. When we combine all of these things together into one network, especially when that network consists of multi-hop links between vehicles or aircraft and mobile terminals, with these highly directional steerable beams that can achieve high throughput. You have a lot of things that you need to do and keep track of to operate an effective network. In the case of a low Earth orbit satellite constellation that's providing connectivity across inter-satellite links, packets are coming in from the internet, often destined to a particular user terminal. When that packet comes from a point of presence, you have choices like which ground station do I use to get up to my constellation right now? Through what series of inter-satellite links do I traverse? And out what spot beam on what satellite do I egress to land at this terminal right now? And that path might be changing in every tens of seconds quite rapidly. In our team's uh, work, we also see similar challenges with high altitude platforms. Projects like Loon, other types of high altitude platform programs have similar challenges. Inter vehicle links between aircraft in the stratosphere and in a near space environment, decisions to be made across what hops do you traverse. What spectrum resources do you use when? How much power do you put into a beam to provide connectivity and meet your service agreements to your customers? 
These things are also increasingly showing up terrestrially. 5G advanced and 6G standards start adding support for integrated access and backhaul networks where towers can dynamically form mesh networks with each other with millimeter wave frequency bands. At Google, our team worked across all projects like this over the course of seven or eight years. In our pursuits to connect the unconnected and bring the next three and a half to five billion people online, we, we worked on low Earth orbit satellite constellations, high altitude platforms, and mesh networks. And because we were working on these things in parallel, and because we identified some common challenges between them, we embarked on a project to solve the challenges I described comprehensively in a way that's agnostic to vehicle type, agnostic to orbit, agnostic communications band, and even domain. What we developed is a system we now call space-time. At Google, we called it Project Minkowski. And it's a new approach to software-defined networking. Instead of looking at a network as just a series of physical links on the ground, maybe between ground stations, points of presence to the internet, and enterprise resources, which is the case in most software-defined networking. Our new vision for a software-defined network is one where, sure, those physical static links are part of our networks. They're important to the way we operate and orchestrate our networks. Our systems need to understand that I can't land traffic at certain ground stations if they can't reach certain enterprise resources behind them. But it's one where we also looked at the structure of the network as being governed by physics and motion of objects across space and time. We took an approach where we said ground stations might have contact opportunities with different satellites at different time intervals, but that can same thing be mapped to links between aircraft and aircraft, or ship to ship communications, or ship to aircraft, or satellite cross orbital regime to another satellite. So we build a system that can build kind of graph view of a network, where at any point in time, the system can analyze and understand with a planet scale digital twin powered by large scales computing clusters. It can analyze every pair of compatible transceivers across land, sea, air, and space all the time, constantly. Anytime two transceivers are compatible, it can record the amount of signal level that would be received by the receiver that we're considering. But it can also understand things like the side lobes of the antennas and how much energy it would impart to other surfaces of the Earth or spatial regions like the geostationary arc of satellites. A system that can understand for every possible choice, pre-compute how much energy would be received by the thing we want to communicate with, but also how much interference that choice would impart upon ourselves or potential adversaries that want to detect our transmissions or potential victims of our interference in a spectrum coordination world. So, um, so like a normal software-defined network, our system allows you to express to it the desire to provision connectivity from a point to another point on the planet, a point to another point on a different planet, or a point to a coverage region on Earth where maybe I'm trying to do direct to handset communications. You don't have to tell our system through what satellite or what communication band you want to use. You tell it your goals, your committed information rates, optionally maybe a latency constraint, and your priority. The system gets to work, solves the rest across land, sea, air, and space, provisioning ground segment resources, ground stations, space relays, airborne communications payloads, shipborne payloads, and everything in between. It supports land, sea, air, low Earth orbit, mid Earth orbit, geostationary orbit, cislunar space, even deep space. So when you're running this system, if you're a satellite operator, what does it actually do for you? Well, it's going to take care of all of the antenna tasking and scheduling, so telling your ground station antennas what to point at what, when, and when to hand over. It's going to take care of the routing function in your network. So there's lots of ways people look to route traffic across the network. Maybe you're using channelizers. Maybe you're using IPv4 or IPv6 switching or segment routing or MPLS. We support all of those types of routing. And it's going to handle your radio resource management, so assigning channels and frequencies and bandwidth. The system has full support for motion propagation, across any orbit, even multi-body propagators for support for cislunar space and deep space. But it can also figure out the motion of aircraft and ships at sea. This is an important feature, because when you're trying to build a multi-hop network that might include things like millimeter wave or optical links between aircraft that are flying with each other, 
When an aircraft banks, it's possible that the wingtip of that aircraft obstructs the link to another aircraft. Our system can see those events ahead of time, proactively evolve a multi-hop path across the network so that that traffic is moved before that event even happens, even if it's just seconds away with seconds of prediction in the near, in the near term. We're also unlocking the industry's ability to operate in bands like V-band and E-band and optical communications and other bands that are highly affected by weather in some cases. Our system is constantly ingesting weather forecasts from polar orbiting satellites from NOAA and the European Climate Model, building a picture of rain and moisture and wind turbulence and surface temperatures from Earth's surface to space. What's, what this lets it do is to constantly analyze how much attenuation or degradation of wireless signals would be encountered between all pairs of compatible links over time, predictively, all the time. And before a storm comes in or another effect, our system will actually move that traffic to avoid that rain fade. It's not just for communications constellations. The solution we built supports store and forward networks such as Earth observation or other Earth sensing missions, where you may have a sensor that's accumulating sensor data. Before space time, you would maybe express that to a ground station as a service operator as a need for maybe five downlinks a day for six minutes each pass. But in space time, you just tell it how much onboard memory you have. You tell it the rate of sensor data acquisition. You just say, make sure this data gets, it gets down before my data overflows. If you see something really critical, you need to get it down fast, you just call us over a software API, tell our system that, and it gets the data down. We even support delay-tolerant networking with bundle protocols. So if you're doing store and forward networking, where intermediate nodes can store packets and forward them, we support this too. The solutions comes ready for atmospheric free space optics, can dynamically land traffic to the ground, dodging storms and fog for optical space to ground links. And it's provided either as a service in any cloud provider on a Kubernetes-based architecture, or if you prefer to have it run in your basement or in an operation center or on an air-gapped in network, we can support that as well. So a bit about the architecture. The way you would use space time if you were a network operator and the way you'd interact with the system is through one of these software APIs. So at the top of the API we call the northbound interface. These, these, these API terminologies are ones that you'll see in any software-defined network. If you're unfamiliar with software-defined networking and you look it up on Wikipedia, you'll see this exact same language and description of the APIs. The northbound interface is where you can express to space-time your desire to provision network services end-to-end. -end. You can request transport to be provisioned between two endpoints, and a few seconds later, the system solves it, lets you know that those services are up, predicts for you if they're ever not going to be available based on orbital geometries or weather, and if a competing priority comes in or a satellite's unexpectedly offline and it impacts your services in the present or tomorrow at 3 p.m., it'll notify whatever software you've built to integrate with the system. The northbound software API is also the way you interact with our system to curate its kind of planet-scale digital twin of the universe. So if you have a satellite ops center and you do an orbital adjustment to a satellite, you call into our system and let it know that you've done that. And within seconds, it's able to update all of the scheduling across the network to accommodate that new motion. Same thing for an updated flight path of an aircraft or a path of a ship. Now, you might have things that are human piloted with absolutely no predictability. Our system can still, for even aircraft that are human piloted, see ahead a few seconds in time. But for things that are totally chaotic, those are fine too. You just tell the system you can update it as often as once a second about the changing motion of that object. The system continuously reschedules all of, the, all of the routing, all of the handovers, and all the spectrum resource assignment across the network. Now on the southbound interface, that's where space-time interacts with the physical infrastructure in the network. Now there's a few ways we support that. If you already have your own ground stations or your own spacecraft payloads and you want to update their software to talk natively to space-time's APIs, you can do that. We make it relatively easy. All of the APIs are available in the open. They all are built on gRPC and protocol buffers, which is a software format that supports automatic code generation in virtually any programming language. So it makes it very easy to integrate. But we also realize that's just not practical for some satellite operators to think about updating their ground station software or their payload software. So we also enable, if you have an existing system that handles this part of your network uh, uh, orchestration for you, 
you can just write a simple adapter to that existing thing. You can connect to space-time, act as the agent for an entire vendor or class of equipment in your infrastructure or segment of your network. So I think this will make a bit more sense if I show it to you live. So I'm gonna walk you through and give you a quick tour of space-time, what it looks like, and what we built. Okay, so this is space-time. First, let me give you a little bit of a tour of what you're looking at here. So for the purpose of this demo, we thought it would be interesting to show you space-time operating a network that it thinks is real. We tried to come up with one of the more complex constellations we could imagine. So what we set up was a constellation that's multi-orbit. This one consists of nine satellites in geostationary orbit, 27 satellites in MEO. For fun, we put them in more of a GPS-like orbital regime instead of equatorial. And then in low Earth orbit, we set up a constellation that's got hundreds of satellites in LEO with inner and intraplane intersatellite links. Now in our visualization, gray lines here denote the sets of intersatellite links that are part of the structure of the network. But space-time's not currently using the light gray ones to route its traffic. The white highlighted lines are showing us the intersatellite links where space-time's currently routing traffic across it to support the service requests that have been requested for space-time to provision to our end users. Now, when I say space-time doesn't know this network isn't real, uh, that's because we have a piece of software representing every node in this large and complex network, connecting to space-time, pretending to be real. You can see the size and scope of that if I switch from the map view to the gra graph view of our network. This is a little more like the view you'd see in a normal software-defined network system. So every icon you see here, I'll bring up the legend, is a device in our network. We have satellites, aircraft, ships at sea, Enterprise resources deep in the ground segment that represent the points of presence to the network. Gateway ground stations providing feeder links to our network. And a large population of fixed and mobile user terminals spread across the Earth. Each one of those systems, even though it's not real and flying for the purpose of this demo, is connecting to space time pretending to be real, receiving all of the scheduling updates for handovers and radio resource management and routing function updates communicating back to the space-time system hosted in the Kubernetes cluster, letting it know that it received those schedules of updates, and providing statuses as it transitions the state of the network on a scheduled basis to support that connectivity. Now I'm gonna zoom in a bit here to a few regions on Earth. If we zoom in here in the, uh, in the Caribbean, you'll see other connectivity. Space-time's actually building air-to-air -air links and air-to-ship links here in the aerial and maritime domain. So let me, let me explain a bit why it's doing that and what it's doing. So we wanted to, to make this constellation not just Leo, Mio, Geo, but also add airborne assets and maritime assets that are capable of forming communication links with each other that could be used at the disposal of the network. Now it's kind of tedious for us to make up fictitious flight paths for a big population of aircraft or ships at sea. So what we did is we hooked space-time up to ADSB transponder information of real flying aircraft, as well as AIS maritime feeds for real ships that are sailing right now. And we, we told space-time, okay, let's pretend these aircraft and these ships have some ability to make communication links with each other. We, we, we have three sort of one-foot parabolic gimbals, and they're attached to these different aircraft and vehicles at different places. They have obstructions from the wingtip and the fuselage at different locations that obstruct their ability to form links with each other. And the aircraft are flying and banking, and the constantly changing geometry and set of obstructions is a constraint that we have to operate this network around. And we see that occurring here. Now the goals that have been expressed to space-time, we can call up here on this left-hand side, labeled service requests. These are the requests that came in through that northbound interface to provision end-to-end -end services for paying customers. We can pick one here and, and, and kind of take a look at it. We can. Uh, see where a customer has requested end-to-end -end connectivity from a, from a ship at sea or an aircraft uh, to a Google Cloud point of presence or one from AWS or Azure or another enterprise node. We can switch to our graph view. I'm gonna pause time because else the graph keeps changing on us. We can understand how space-time's found a way to provision that service. 
So shown on the right hand side where it says service request, we see that there's a request made to provision one megabit of service, please, end to end. Please connect this aircraft. Find a way to connect this aircraft with one megabit a second of traffic, end to end, with this enterprise resource deep in my network. And the system is constantly looking at the present and into the future, and it's finding opportunities where the geometry and the link budgets allow a link to exist at E-band between these two aircraft. Between this aircraft and this LEO satellite, LEO 193, and that LEO satellite has a gateway link to a ground station in Arlington, Virginia, that has a fiber connection to our enterprise resource. Spacetime's ability to look end-to-end -end across the network and understand these things is especially powerful. It means that if a submarine fiber gets cut or terrestrial network connectivity goes down, that can be represented in spacetime. It can understand it and adapt immediately. Same with the links between the gateway and the satellite, the satellite and the aircraft, and the aircraft and the next one in the mesh connectivity. So with the tap, I can go back to the present. A few things to note here. You can see some purple showing up on the map. This is global precipitation right now because space-time thinks the, the system is really flying right now and operating. It's keeping track of how much precipitation exists across the planet and is using that to calculate the amount of rain fade that would be experienced not only by the links we're actively using, which we might have measurements or telemetry for, but all other hypothetical links that could exist. Because our system's designed to also support laser communications from space to ground and air to ground, I can toggle and view things like wind speed and the amount of turbulence in the atmosphere globally. We also have cloud moisture, subtly different than the amount of actual cloud cover. This is the water content of the clouds. Spacetime's keeping track of this because we support really any RF frequency from one megahertz to 100 gigahertz and certain frequencies are highly affected by moisture. This lets the system understand when and where it can use those links and automatically reschedule connectivity around it. Surface temperatures are also present. The system's really not relegated to just the air and space and maritime domains. We support point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint terrestrial connectivity as well. So we've talked a lot about space-time's ability to react uh, proactively, to kind of see into the future at motion and schedule the network around it. But what about unexpected events? So we'll look here and, and, and maybe per, pick a satellite to dynamically make unavailable in our network. So if I switch over here and we look at the Caribbean, I'm gonna pick on probably the most important satellite I can find at the moment, this LEO satellite 193. It's operating in V-band. It has 48 routes flowing through it. We can see here that um, it's providing critical connectivity to a population of terminals. There's 19 active user links. Oh, actually 50 routes transiting through it. Let's destroy this satellite or take it down for maintenance unexpectedly, somehow impair it. We could take out one of its inner satellite links, its gateway links, one of its user beams. We're just gonna be ruthless. We're gonna take out the whole thing. So if you watch the white lines here, which represent the inner satellite links used for routing, and you watch the green lines, which are the user beams, You'll see them change as space-time recalculates all of the handovers and all of the radio resource management and all of the routing network-wide. And in the aerial domain, if we watch, you can even see the connectivity here in the terrestrial topology evolve for air-to-air -air and maritime connectivity to adapt links around the loss of that satellite. We see a handover happening here in mid-Earth orbit as flows are gracefully transitioned off of that node. And now that transfer is complete. There's no more flows dependent on LEO satellite 193. We've handed over our flows. We've changed our inner satellite link routing. We've sent all of the scheduling to all of the affected nodes across land, sea, air, and space to update their handover schedules, their radio resource management, their routing functions and rules to deal with the loss of that satellite and move our services over. Now, one of the things we learned operating networks like this at Google, especially with projects like Loon, which are multi-hop networks, meshes in the stratosphere in a near space environment, is that debugging these sorts of systems is difficult and complex. When you have a report that a, that a, a user, or maybe even a ship at sea, 
lost connectivity at some time. And they want to know why exactly that happened, what went wrong, and what hardware or software was to blame. The ability to call up that information is something that's critically important in these sort of networks. So in our system, you can just call up the point of interest that's important to you, the time range where you know an event happened, and then just drag time to that moment. And within seconds, the system snaps to not only the logical network topology and the graph, but the service requests, the weather, everything that existed at that network at that historical time, so that your network operators can understand, hey, you know, what, what wasn't supported at that time? When did I have an outage? What was the path that that request for that customer was taking across land, sea, air, and space? Any domain, any frequency band, any orbit. With the tap, we can go back to the present. So a few more interesting aspects to show here. One is space-time's ability to support things beyond just our domain. So if we go and, say, call up uh, connectivity here in uh, the, lunar, the lunar domain, we can see connectivity here, just a moment, toggle to moon. So we've told space-time that there were antennas at all the Apollo landing sites. And we added a, a lunar relay at an Earth-Moon Lagrange point. And you can see here an example of space-time's ability to even support service requests out in cislunar space and figure out opportunities for those connectivities to exist and to schedule them. If you select a link in space-time, you can also recall information about that link's wireless signal propagation modeling. Because we have a full digital twin that's calculating energy levels and signal strengths and rain, all of this information is also accessible in the system and able to be recalled and analyzed by network operators. Okay. So I know we mentioned that everything in this scenario is virtualized, but there's actually some real links in it as well. So space-time actually has, in the system, connectivity from our roof in Livermore, running at 100 gigabit with real hardware linked to the top of nearby Mount Diablo. So that's some of the things that you'll hear more about this fall. Now, space-time has been used with other real hardware and extensively. This is the same software stack and system that powered Loon's network at scale for two or three years. Loon operated communications payloads in the near space environment. Shown here are all the different flight paths where Loon navigated around the world. And you can notice kind of uh, hot spots where the system autonomously navigated and provided end-to-end -end connectivity services direct to handset for users in Peru. We restored connectivity after Hurricane Maria in the Caribbean and Puerto Rico. And we provided commercial services direct to handset in Kenya. These were something like satellites in a near space environment. The mesh connectivity between these unmanned aircraft in the stratosphere was quite extensive. Links up to 700 kilometers aircraft to aircraft and 220 kilometers slant range air to ground, all at E band, dodging storms dynamically and constructing multi-path connectivity up to 20 hops deep with meshes more than 4,000 kilometers in scale, all autonomously without human operators scheduling or involved in that network orchestration. Chris started out mentioning that space time has been selected as the common control plane for a US government initiative called the Hybrid Space Architecture. Now the Hybrid Space Architecture seeks to improve the resilience of networks, especially public sector networks, through interoperability across Department of Defense, other civil government groups, uh, NOAA, NASA networks, and commercial space companies. To achieve this vision of networks that are interoperable across land, sea, air, and space, 
the existence of a common network control plane that can schedule resources across them dynamically and provision them is really key. It's one of the things that's really eluded government initiatives to build all domain networks for years. There's a reason that people have been drawing lightning bolt diagrams connecting planes and ships and satellites for decades unsuccessfully. So space time will support the common control plane for these initiatives. And we look forward to partnering with all the other folks on, on contract and we uh, already are facilitating these integrations with providers of ground station as a service, uh, earth observation, and other systems that are integrating with space time as part of the hybrid space architecture. We also announced this morning that space time has been selected to orchestrate and operate the Rivada Space Networks constellation. We're really excited about this partnership with Rivada. Rivada's constellations design is quite unique. It's a, it's a gateway-less architecture, optionally. They support the ability to go terminal to terminal without flowing back through a gateway ground station and back again to the user, which creates millions of possible paths across the constellation and is really well suited to our combined strengths together as a partnership. And another exciting news for us at Illyria, we've also been selected to be the constellation operating system to operate the Alto constellation of high altitude stratospheric vehicles. So this is, Alto is the group that was formerly the Zephyr platform from Airbus. And we're, and we're really excited to bring our background and heritage operating complex high altitude platform constellations in partnership with Alto. Now for operators that are using space time, one of the other value propositions we're excited to tell you about is the ability to facilitate interoperability between your own assets as a network operator and others. So we explained earlier space time's northbound interface, which lets you express your customer's service requests, also provide holistic understanding of the network, and that southbound interface where it actually reaches out and schedules your assets and talks to them, either talking to them natively or through some existing adapter that you already have. But what if one satellite operator has a customer request that they really can't fulfill with their own assets that they exclusively control? Or what if that's not the best way to fulfill it? What if they want to make dynamic use of ground station as a service, but use that in conjunction with their own resources or a commercial space relay provider? Well, that's what our East-West API supports for Federation. So the way this works is our optimization engine that's able to dynamically resolve the network within seconds it understands after supporting all of its service requests and solving them throughout the network, what resources are left idle? Like, is there a ground station that remains unused? Is there a space relay link or a spare capacity in a beam that's left over? But it also understands opportunities where it can find alternatives to its use. So say there's a request for all of your customers as a satellite operator, and you figure out, uh, space time figures out a thousand ways to pick different link vectors from different resources and beams to configure the network over time and support those requests. It arbitrarily maybe picks the first ranked order one, but there's a thousand of them that meet your service level agreements. Well, what if picking number two or number seven or number 144 is much, much more valuable to another satellite operator because maybe you're coordinating spectrum with them. They could be a secondary user on your band and you wanna capture value together in a much more flexible way to share spectrum. Or maybe it's because it's critical that they be able to use your ground station for some very urgent mission or, or priority or something of importance to national security. So the East-West API allows one instance of space time to advertise to others, hopefully using space time, but it's fine if they're not. The APIs are all open. To advertise opportunities for someone else to reserve your resources, whether that's ground stations or space relays or aircraft or ships or terminals or spectrum at different time intervals and at different rates that you've established in the market that you want to advertise them for. And maybe you want different private pricing for different parties. And it allows those other participants to do the same with you. So together that allows for wholly more flexible ways to craft interoperability and coordination between instances and across the industry. These APIs that are open and available really create wonderful opportunities for all of you in the room to build software that integrate with us. One that we can announce is a partnership where Anduril, 
for public sector is building a decision management and battle management system that can sit on top of space-time, query space-time to understand when end-to-end -end transport across a network of steerable beams and multiple hops is possible, and if they decide in their battle management decision support system that it needs to provision a flow across the network or connect a reconnaissance platform to an operations center so they can stream a video feed of something that someone needs to see, it can task space-time dynamically to set up a multi-hop topology and provision resources and spectrum across the network so that that is possible, get confirmation that it's up, and use that to better understand and better decide and better act in conflict scenarios. We can also share our partnership with systems integrators and invite further partnerships with systems integrators to help build, bring these sort of solutions to customers. So Lidos is one of our partners that will be using space time and leveraging it as a systems integrator to bring this technology to US public sector customers that they're already working with and have established relationships with for years. Now, as of today, all of these software APIs are available open source on GitHub with unlimited rights. We think this is very important to the vision we're seeking to achieve. Because if we're going to be successful as an industry in achieving a common control plane for land, sea, air, and space networks, facilitating interoperability and shared use of each other's space relays and ground stations and spectrum, and if the US government's going to be successful in its vision to build all domain networks, the common control plane is key, but there's also going to be a lot of work on integrating all of these assets into this common platform. And the last thing we want to do is have a perception of vendor lock and be a barrier to that greater vision for the industry. So by open sourcing all of our APIs and making them available, it means people can trust that if they build these integrations with us and we turn out not to be the best solution, those integrations haven't gone to waste. They can replace it with any other control plane that supports these same open source APIs. These APIs provide you ways to describe the motion of your assets, the ephemeris of your orbits, things like TLEs, Keplerian elements, state vectors, transmitter and receive chains, antenna gain patterns. You'll find all these things in the APIs, as well as ways to describe end-to-end -end service requests. Developer guides are also available. They have really helpful tutorials. It makes it really easy to build and integrate. And my last slide is to share an exciting tie-in between this technology and future 5G advanced and 6G non-terrestrial networks. If you're keeping track of the buzz at Mobile World Congress, there's a lot of talk about these future 5G NTN systems. It presents an opportunity for us to align the industry around the much larger economies of scale of the global mobile telecom industry with common modems, common architectures, common means for authentication, and core network integration. And we've seen huge progress this past year as satellite operators have been demonstrating uh, direct to handset connectivity and use of this new 5G NTN air interface. But one piece that's been missing is the infrastructure to support service management and orchestration of these networks if they're non-geostationary constellations. It's relatively simple to use the 5G NTN air interface to a handset if it's a geostationary system, but for these multi-hop, non-geostationary, increasingly complex systems, that's been a missing piece to their adoption. So Illyria is committing and is partnering and contributing APIs through the Telecom Infra Project, aligning our solutions with the emerging requirements and common operator-led definition of requirements and testing and certification criteria through an industry consortia called the Telecom Infra Project that's also home to the Open RAN project to make space-time Open RAN compliant and to evolve ORAN APIs to be open and interoperable so that space-time can support orchestration of all of these 5G NTN and 6G future 5G non-terrestrial networks. We look forward to partnering with all of you in this room to build integrations to make this future possible. We hope to help you solve your problems and your increasing complexity in your network. With that, I'll invite Chris Taylor out for some closing remarks.
Thank you, Brian. Uh, excellent demonstration, my friend. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yes, we know we're the only thing between you and the reception, so let me wrap this up. I hope what we've shown you is that there's now a platform that any wonderful, amazing uh, technological discovery can use and be employed across any manner of markets. The idea that we have the ability to make anything speak to anything else, which, is increase it, which increases the speed with, with which all of you get to market faster, all of you complete mission better, is here. We'd love to talk to any of you about it, all of you about it. There's a whole table of us sitting over there. Feel free to, to, to talk to them during the reception. Um, but we're so glad that we had the opportunity to speak to you all today, and we look forward to, uh, to seeing you all throughout the conference. And uh, we'll see you at the reception. Thank you very much. All right. No, Chris is not the only thing keeping you from the reception. It's me. Um, but thank you so much, Chris, Brian, and the team at Illyria for that presentation and demo for supporting uh, Satellite. Uh, what a great first day. I'd also like to thank our, our luncheon keynote speakers, uh, Tess, Lori, Mike, uh, and also our opening keynote at the, the uh, GovMill Forum, Chuck Beams. Uh, fantastic first day, and this concludes uh, the Monday conference program at Satellite 2023. I invite all of you to join us right next door for drinks and hors d'oeuvres at our welcome reception sponsored by Amazon Project Kuiper, which is also kicking off tomorrow's activities with a featured keynote from Amazon Project Kuiper Senior Vice President of Devices and Services, Dave Limp. That takes place right here tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m., followed by our opening general session. And we hope you enjoy your experience tonight and this week in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're off to a great start. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow for another exciting day at Satellite 2023. Thank you all so much. Have a great night, and we'll see you here tomorrow.